So lately, I've been deep into Cave Trenardi's discography and wanted to create an updated series on his sound. We'll be exploring his full sound in time, but today, I'll be focusing on those distinctive, funky bass lines. Here's the bass line from Cave Trenardi's remix of Janet Jackson's track, If. The drums in this project are from my Cave Trenada sample library, available on Samples by Vanity. I have a handful of observations about this melody. The note A acts as the root or foundational note. The other notes in the melody revolve around this pitch, providing a stable anchor for the bass line. For about 75% of the bass line, Cave Trenada alternates between just two notes. These two note patterns are often followed by another set of two note patterns, creating a consistent stepwise motion. The bass line frequently moves in a stepwise motion where the interval between consecutive notes is no more than a step. Cachinada introduces larger interval jumps such as moving from B to D or E to G. These larger leaps add variety and break up the repetition of the stepwise patterns, making the bass line more engaging. These interval jumps have the secondary purpose of acting as bridges between the stepwise motion phrases, providing a sense of progression and development. The combination of simple repetitive two-note patterns and unexpected larger interval jumps creates a balance of predictability and surprise which is is key to the baseline's captivating groove. Here's the baseline with these jumps removed. Notice how removing these jumps makes the sections of the bass line feel disconnected and less dynamic. The contrast between the stepwise motions and the larger leaps is essential to maintaining the bass line's interest and energy. Cave Trenada employs different note lengths to add variety and interest to the bass line. Instead of relying solely on changing pitches, the variation in note durations keeps the listener engaged and adds a dynamic quality to the groove. The rhythm of the bass line is somewhat syncopated, meaning that the note notes often fall on offbeats or in between strong beats. This off-kilter timing creates a compelling groove that adds to the track's funky feel. The overall contour of the melody trends upwards as the three-bar phrase progresses. This rising motion imparts a sense of momentum and forward movement, making the conclusion of the phrase feel satisfying and complete. Here's another Cajunada bass line, this time from his track 10%. Let's compare this with the bass line from his remix of Janet Jackson's If. Here's them playing back to back. For a clearer comparison, I've transposed the remix bass line down an octave to align them visually. Several similarities become apparent. Both bass lines cover a similar note range. The lowest note in both tracks is A. The highest note in 10% is G, while in the IF remix, it's A. The 10% bass line spans a full octave, whereas the IF bass line occupies one note in the scale less. They're also both in the same key, which wasn't intentional on my part, but showcases Cave Trenada's focus on simplicity. The 10% bass line consists of just three notes. Cave Trenada uses note length to create a variation and maintain interest, rather than relying on a wide array of pitches. In contrast, the IF Remix bass line utilizes six different notes, but as already mentioned, for 75% of the melody, K Trenada alternates between just two notes. In both cases, it's the variation in note lengths that truly defines the groove. This reinforces the idea that a minimalistic approach to note selection, combined with creative rhythmic patterns, are a key ingredient in K Trenada's sound. The 10% bass line features two distinct sections, each composed of two note patterns with an additional note introduced for variation. These additional notes are a mirrored flip of the main pattern, providing a sense of symmetry and cohesion. Now, let's take these principles and apply them to create an original bass line inspired by K Trenada's style. By focusing on a minimal note selection, varied rhythms and structured patterns, we can develop a groove that's both simple and captivating. When crafting bass lines, there are numerous approaches you can take. A common piece of advice is to anchor your bass line to the root note of your scales or the chords in your track. This is solid guidance and works well in many scenarios. 
However, when dealing with short, repetitive two or three note chord patterns, like those often used by Keishinada, this approach can sometimes make the chord sound stale and repetitive. The bass line significantly influences how you perceive the chords. By varying the bass notes, you can make a repetitive chord pattern feel fresh and engaging. This works as the bass notes you choose can redefine the root note of the chord in the listener's mind providing a new dimension to the harmony. When the chords are repeating, the groove of the bass line becomes the focal point. A well-crafted bass line can transform a simple repetitive chord progression into something more dynamic and captivating. This is especially effective with bass lines that have a strong groove, drawing the listener's attention away from the repetitive nature of the chords. The approach I use for writing a bass line is as follows. Start with the root note of your chord or scale. This note serves as the anchor for your bass line, providing a foundation that the other notes will gravitate around. In our example, let's use the note E as the root. Stacking perfect fifths, intervals of seven semitones, is a common technique to add harmonic richness and structure. From the root note, E, the perfect fifth would be B. Stacking another on top, would be G. Simply stacking fifths can sound too rigid or sparse. To make the bass line more interesting, incorporate smaller melodic fragments that connect to these larger intervals. The octave is a simple yet powerful tool in bass line construction. Using octaves can add depth and variety to your bass line while maintaining a strong tonal center. In my melody, 11 of the 12 notes are either the root or a fifth interval. In terms of the movement, I've stuck to the guidance of not having more than three stepwise motions together, otherwise it can sound like you're playing a scale. I've aligned most of the notes to the grid, given that we're working with a four on the floor drum pattern. This alignment ensures that the bass line is tightly synchronized with the rhythm section, maintaining a steady groove. I have utilized elements of rhythmic anticipation, shifting two notes just after the expected beat, adding a touch of surprise and momentum. An 808 style bass often fits well with this approach, but what if you want to incorporate a real bass like Keishinada often does? Here are some methods to consider. The best option for authentic, nuanced bass lines is to work with a session musician. A couple of hours should be sufficient to provide you with various riffs that you can then chop and rearrange to fit your future tracks. If hiring a musician isn't feasible, another effective method is to use loops from sample libraries. By creatively splicing and rearranging these chops, you can construct a new melody that retains the richness and texture of the real thing. If neither of these options sound appealing, then the third option is virtual instruments. While nothing can fully replace the sound of a real bass guitar, high quality sample libraries like those in contact can come close. All of the tricks I just covered in writing for 808s can be applied equally as effectively here. I sometimes even write 808 patterns using a bass library in contact to help refresh my ears. Now, let's cover the sound design of a typical k patch. The 808 patch was created in Serum, using a single oscillator set to the dual toy wavetable. Let's break down the steps I took to shape this sound. I began by assigning LFO1 to the wavetable position, subtly moving it through the first few frames. Although this modulation is quite minimal and doesn't have a significant effect on this particular wavetable, it was useful while I was auditioning different tables to add some movement and variation. I applied a low pass filter with the cutoff set around the 10 o'clock position. This helps tame the high frequencies and focus the sound in the lower register, essential for that deep 808 tone. I then shaped envelope 1 to control the amplitude of the sound. This envelope shape was then duplicated to envelope 2, which I assigned to the filter cutoff. This setup allowed the filter to gradually open up, introducing more of the distorted harmonics as the sound evolves. Additionally, I assigned envelope 2 to the drive control, which adds even more grit and warmth as the filter opens. For the characteristic 808 pitch drop, I used LFO2 to modulate the master pitch. This can be set up in the matrix tab, creating a distinctive downward pitch slide at the start of the sound, which is a hallmark of classic 808s. In the voices section, I've set Serum to monophonic mode, ensuring only one note plays at a time. Depending on your pattern, you might also want to enable some portamento to smoothly slide between notes, adding a gliding character to your bass line. 
I finalized the sound with two effects, distortion to shape the tone of the 808, followed by the Hyper Dimension plugin to add width to the sound. While 808s are traditionally kept mono for a focused low end, Caetronada often incorporates some stereo width into his 808s. An alternative approach is to use unison or a stereo widening tool. For more precise control, you can use a mid-side EQ to process the stereo width. Apply the stereo widening effect to frequencies above 80 Hz while keeping everything below that frequency in mono. This technique ensures the low end remains centered and solid, maintaining the punch and clarity of your bass. But a lazy version of this is what I went for by running the sub oscillator as a direct out, meaning none of the effects were applied to it. If you're eager for a deeper exploration of Caetronada sound, you might find this 2006 16 video particularly intriguing. In it, I remake Caetronada's remix of Janet Jackson's If, delving into his production techniques and how he achieves his distinctive style. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.